back in May using the idea of graceful exit, how it is that we can transition out of this life. And as we'll see, not just this life, anything that ends. I'll come back to that in just a second. And so the second bardo is the luminous bardo of Dharmata. This is really in a sense where all heaven breaks loose, where the thermonuclear power of the awakened mind is released without the mediation of the body. It's a brilliant, fantastically uh, radiant bardo that constitutes a large part of the classic Tibetan Book of the Dead, which of course Professor Thurman has translated. The topic for the program that we will be discussing is actually on the third bardo, the uh, karmic bardo of becoming. And this in a certain sense is where all hell breaks loose <laughs> because karma now comes back into play. And um, the kind of narrative of this weekend is uh, not so much graceful exit, but now graceful entry. How to take birth, how to shape our mind um, during the Bartles, and as we'll see, it just as importantly, even now during life. And so within the classic kind of Bardo uh, array of experiences, this particular Bardo constitutes the virtual entirety, according to the Tibetan uh, view, of what we experience after we die. The luminous Bardo of Dharmata is just, for most people, it's just a finger snap. Um, this particular Bardo, the karmic Bardo becoming Solar days, uh, you know, have heard it before, um, on average around 49 solar days. But just like everything else in, in the Bardo, nothing is fixed, not even this particular duration. And when we go through the course, we will actually discuss what it is that constitutes that duration. Why is it that some people transition extremely quickly, and while others, it takes more time to negotiate this particular Bardo. But the really important point is that the Bardo principle is itself iterative. It, it's like those fractals that we've all seen by now, which means that, you know, with a fractal, right, the closer you look, the more you see. And, and so with Bardo Principle, what, what we do with these programs is we use, in fact, the archetype of the Bardos as they're directed towards the end of life. But then we point out how life and death, birth and rebirth takes place every day, small deaths, moment to moment, day to day, literally um, thought to thought. And so this program is not just about graceful rebirth, graceful re uh, entry um, after this particular life, but it's just as much about how to take form, how to shape your mind moment to moment after the dissolution of a job, of a relationship, basically anything that ends. And so once you are sensitized to Bardo tenets, Bardo principles, you will start to discover them everywhere. Um, not just the gaps between lives, but the gaps between thoughts, the spaces between virtually anything. And so what we will be doing in this program is in a certain way, engaging these small deaths, these uh, bardos, these gaps in our life, almost like, almost like a pop quiz for the final exam. That is Kabir once said of death, what is found now is found then. And so you will die the way you live. And you can learn a great deal about your portent, you know, to, what to expect after you die by how you negotiate things when things fall apart, when the rug of your reality is pulled out from under your feet. And therefore, these Bardo principles have immediate applicability right here, right now, because going with what's going on with COVID, the social political unrest, we are in a Bardo right now. I mean, in particular, focusing on COVID-19, you know, the snow globe has been shaken. And so what new directions will we as a culture, as a world take? How will we collectively take rebirth? This is very much an open question and these principles can very much be guiding principles for us. What opportunities does it present? And I wanted to share a really compelling statement I heard from the great historian Yuval Noah Harari who's written a number of these amazing books. And he said this in a podcast I heard a number of months ago. I found it so compelling, I wrote it down. Because the minute I heard this, I said, oh my God, this is exactly related to Bardo principles. So this is what you've all said. The choices made during this time will shape the world for decades. This is equally a political crisis and a massive social experiment conducted on billions of people. 
perhaps our sense of invincibility will go down and we will realize we are animals like every other animal and therefore deeply woven into the fabric of nature, end quote. And so this opening line to me is so compelling. The choices made during this time, individually, collectively, socially, politically, will shape the world for decades to come. And in exactly the same way, this is what happens in the Bardos. And so this program is really about how to shape your life, how to shape your mind, not just after you die, but right now, moment to moment. And according to the classic Bardo literature, without preparation, the Bardos are very challenging times because this is when the rug of reality has been pulled out from underneath us. That's one of the ways to define what a Bardo is. And so the ultimate rug arguably is, is the rug of our very body. And when that rug is pulled out from underneath us, how will we in fact respond to that space, to that freedom? I, I, I reflect that on this a little bit. I would, there, we actually had a freak snowstorm here in Colorado. It was, it was 101 degrees on Saturday and on Tuesday it was down to 20. And I was stepping outside <laughs> and there was a patch of ice there. I wasn't you know, ready to see ice. And I slipped. And as I slipped, I just impulsively reached out to grasp. And as I did that, I said, oh my gosh, this is exactly the way I'm going to respond in the Bardos. That when you die, you're going to slip. The rug of your reality, your, your very body will be pulled out from underneath you. And it's, it's really like slipping on, a, on a, a sheet of ice. And that very karmic habitual impulse to grasp, to retain stability, that kind of panicky feeling of falling becomes somewhat generative in the after death state that can actually propel us involuntarily this kind of grasping for ground into an entire samsaric existence. And so we can gain an intimation of this experience in yet another way. And this is what we're going to be exploring in some detail, at least I will with my time with you by looking at our dreams very interesting in the Buddhist world, I've heard some scholars talk about the bardos, the death bardos is literally the dream at the end of time. And in dream yoga, according to Kempo Kartar and other um, masters, dream yoga came about largely as a way to prepare for death. And this is super interesting to me because if you look at the nature of your normal non-lucid dreams, a dream where you don't know that you're dreaming, if you don't attain lucidity and take some level of control in a dream, which we don't when we're non-lucid, what takes control? Well, your habits take control, your karma, your actually your <laughs> habits think for you, your habits decide for you. But the real good news is that once you attain lucidity in the dream state, the tables are instantly turned what previously had complete control over you, now you have control over. And so in a very similar way, what we will be working with is developing a lucid bardo experience, where according to these teachings, if we don't wake up and become lucid in the bardos, again, what takes control? What dictates the bardo experience? Well, look at your dreams. Again, this bardo principle is iterative. Your habits take control. I, I heard Trungpa Rinpoche once said to a question that I've been asked like a thousand times, what is it that takes rebirth? What is it that reincarnates? And he playfully but pr profoundly once said, your bad habits, your karma. And so that's why this is called the karmic bardo of becoming. And so we will be working with the nocturnal dream, nighttime dream, as a way to prepare for the dream at the end of time. We'll also be working with the mind as it plays out moment to moment in the way thoughts actually manifest through the meditations that we'll be discussing. But really the, the key for me with the Bardos is that as, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, the Bardos are a very dangerous time if you're unprepared. But if you are prepared, precisely the uh, kind of aspiration of these programs, they become literally a once in a lifetime opportunity. They become a very opportune time because karma is temporarily suspended. And then even when karma is reinstated, the environment is very fluid. And so that fluidity 
becomes either a blessing or a curse, depending on how you relate to it. And, and I've heard some lamas talk about the analogy that in daily life, if you have a big tree stump, yeah, it can take 25, 30 people to move this big tree stump that's on land. But if you take that exact same tree stump and you put it in a fluid environment like water, one person can direct it. And so the fluidity of the bardo state, the groundless nature of the bardo state, therefore becomes either opportune or obstacle, depending on our preparation and our ability to relate to it. And so um, there's a very, I often talk about how I'll take teachings and wisdom everywhere I can get it. Well, this one I got, this particular wisdom tip, I got from a, a modern sage, Dumbledore, right? Dumbledore. Oh, yeah. From the Harry Potter series, where, where he says, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. And so what these Bardo teachings do is, in fact, they organize the mind to transform obstacle into opportunity, to, to transform it into this adventure. And the kind of mixing metaphors, I look at it as these teachings are kind of like the installation of a GPS, a global positioning system that will help you orient yourself to the experience. Because one of the characteristics of the Bardos, at least when one is unprepared, is in fact bewilderment. And uh, the kind of the, 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 dis the disquietude that takes place when all your normal bearings have been pulled out from under you. I mean, how do you relate when you're entering a really uh, completely unknown terrain. And so what these teachings do is, is they really install this kind of GPS so that when these um, otherwise harrowing experiences in the Bardo take place, we actually have some sense of familiarity, some sense of recognition. And as Professor Thurman knows all too well, one of the most frequently stated lines in the Tibetan Book of the Dead is in fact, recognition and liberation are simultaneous. But how can you recognize something you've never met? And so this is where the meditations come into play. Uh, a large part of what I will be doing with you is introducing you to a set of practices, some of which you're already familiar with, and I'm going to kind of tweak, tailor a little bit for the Bardo journey, as in fact a way to introduce you to the subtle dimensions of your mind that are in fact revealed in the Bardo state. So it's the image I sometimes um, share here is that how, how can you expect to meet, let alone recognize something in the darkness of the night that you haven't met in the full light of the day? And so we will be engaging in diurnal daily practices going from somewhat gross entry level to increasingly refined, which itself somewhat mirrors the trajectory of death altogether, going from more dualistic to more um, non-dualistic states of mind, from fully formed to increasingly formless dimensions of mind. This is something that we can prepare and work for now. And so Bardo teachings, they're not just didactic doctrinal um, material. Bardo is something you can practice. It's a yoga. Death is something you can practice. And so we will be doing this using the euphemism for death, which is letting go. Letting go is just a euphemism for death. And so using a series of classic meditations, we will learn how to differentiate, release, die to, let go, false levels of identification, false levels of gross form, and therefore transition into increasingly subtle dimensions of, of mind in exactly the same way, according to these teachings, that these experiences will unfurl for us, um, unfortunately, on non-negotiable and uncompromising terms. And so therefore, I playfully refer to death now as a wrathful form of liberation. It's wrathful because it's non-negotiable and uncompromising. But we can turn it into a graceful exit and then a graceful entry if we engage in these teachings and then the practices that quite literally bring them to life and as we'll see also bring them into death. And so there's a, there's a, a wonderful kind of summarizing jingle here that um, actually comes from the Christian mystical tradition. I'm sure many of you have heard it, which is kind of characteristic of the type of practices that I will be introducing to you. And this is the following. 
if you die before you die, then when you die, you will not die. <laughs> if you release, let go of, differentiate from gross, substantial, fully formed dimensions of being before you're forced to do so at the moment of death, then when it actually takes place at the moment of death, you've kind of been there, done that, so to speak. And there'll be a sense of recognition and then liberation ensues upon that recognition. And so this is what separates the program that Bob and I will be presenting with you from like a university level course. It's not just didactic material. Of course, there'll be a lot of that. <clears throat> we'll be engaging in, in, a, in a series of traditional, very powerful contemplations. And then really arguably in my estimation, the most important component really are these incredibly sophisticated spiritual technologies the meditations that are designed specifically to prepare for this journey. And so once we're armed with all this, then, you know, death does in fact become the next great adventure. And it's said, um, I've heard a, a number of teachers say that the actual highest level of practitioner looks forward to the moment of death, not in a weird masochistic suicidal way, of course, but because they realize they have something to look forward to. They realize that in a very real way, it does present a kind of once in a lifetime opportunity. But again, that doesn't happen. It's very interesting. Uh, I was doing some research about um, states of upheaval around the virus. And studies have actually shown that when generally when things fall apart, the default is actually regressive. The default is to capitulate to old habitual patterns, to try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again when sometimes that's not the best a way to go forward. And so this type of, of uh, opportunity that the Bartos present won't happen on its own, at least according to this tradition. It happens um, based on the preparation which the spiritual path in general does. I've often looked at the spiritual path as a kind of death in slow motion. The Bardo Yoga basically just accentuates that, highlights that, um, distills it into a succinct body of teachings and practices that not only have tremendous applicability for ourselves, and here's the last thing I'm going to share with you, but they bring about tremendous benefit for others. Because when you develop this kind of confidence from these teachings, from these practices and the experiences that unfold for you, you come to realize that even though the storylines between us may in fact be different, the nature of the mind is the same. We share this same common bed of mind. And this is why His Holiness the Dalai Lama could say with such confidence, we all want to be happy. We all share this kind of same matrix of mind. And so the confidence born from these practices that I can speak from my own experience, working in hospice and, and working with dying people will be of tremendous benefit, not just for yourself, but for others. Because the stability of your own mind and heart becomes contagious. This is, this is good contagion, where you enter an environment that is unsettled, barter like groundless, you know, whether it's the virus or literally an ICU or someone literally dying. And your mere presence without saying a word can become transformative because you kind of exude this stability born from these teachings. And um, I think we need to keep that in mind as we engage in, in these programs because it's not just about what we do for ourselves. We do these practices and studies, um, you know, obviously for ourselves provisionally, but then ultimately it's for the benefit of all sentient beings. And so this is kind of the spectrum of, of material that I will be presenting with you with, with Dr. Thurman's um, support. And at this point, Bob, I'd love to turn it over to you and have you chime in. Oh, well, thank you, Andrew. Actually, I, I'd like to say that I'm honored to be working with Andrew. And I'm very, I'm a fan of Andrew's books, Preparing to Die and the Dreams of Light, which is of course the training in the lucid dreaming, which is the best, best yoga to prepare for the bardo. And uh, I really enjoy working with you, Andrew, and listening to you. And, uh, and uh, you have, is that a starscape in Boulder behind you or is that No, this is, this is, I, I'm radiating standing. this on my green screen, Bob. I, <laughs> it's a really good one, though. I like it. It is. It's like the Milky Way or something. But, uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing, I think, that um, 
that some sector of our people here in America are finally beginning to look at death. You know, when I translated the Book of the Dead, which I only did because uh, my teacher gave me a copy and said I ha I had to. <laughs> there was already several translations around, which I I was not a hundred percent in favor of them for some reasons. I like some aspects of some of them, but. So, I mean, they could always use another one, I thought, but I still didn't feel like doing it until somebody asked me and then he, then I remember that he said, I must do it. Hmm. So then I did it. But when I did it, what I discovered was the strange thing that it took Tibet from the 8th century until the 14th century to have access to the Book of the Dead, which doesn't mean that individuals in Tibetan history Great lamas, the Sakyapas, the Nyingmas, and hadn't hadn't already, you know, adventured through the stages of death and rebirth and all of that, and were fully aware of it. But the people, the nation as a whole, didn't have it. You know, the tradition is that Padmasambhava put it together based on the Guhyagarbha Tantra, and then he hid it, and then it was found only about six hundred years later. And um, and then I was wondering why would that be? You know, why, why bother to hide it? Why not hand it out right away? And then I realized, well, why don't we have a Book of the Dead in America? And of course, I realized that our country is too authoritarian for the authorities here to really encourage, either religious or political, to encourage us to be aware of death, because being aware of death is not at all a morbid and depressing thing being really genuinely escaping from the denial of death that we normally live with and we think it's a cool thing to do and uh, and then confronting it and then realizing its implications is the best way to be really vividly and vitally alive and then you don't want to work in somebody's maggie's farm you don't want to work on maggie's farm no more you don't want to go in like george w's war no more you know you don't want to do that you want quality time you know i always hark back to that elizabeth kubler ross who was a pioneer ahead of us andrew in opening the door to death for the american people wonderful psychologist probably many people online with us have heard of her but i love that one saying she had where she said i've been with ten thousand people helping them go through the death transition and not one of them ever said to me that their deepest regret was not having spent another day at the office. <laughs> <laughs> I always love that. You know, you want they want you want quality time. If you could die anytime, and you're gonna die anytime, you know, we don't know when we're gonna die. We do know we're going to die for sure, but when we don't know what happened. You slipped that time, thank heaven you caught yourself or you rolled with it or whatever happened to you on the ice. I cracked a rib badly once when I slipped on ice a few years ago, and it was with me as a pain for a long, long time. And I, luckily, I didn't smash my head or something. And um, so it could happen anytime to any of us. And that brings us alive, you know. Now, in particular, it's very auspicious, this workshop we're going to do, because, uh, and I'm so pleased and happy that you're doing it with me. And um, because I'm just the people who published my book of the dead translation finally realized it might be useful to have an audio book after like 20 years or something. So I've been taping it in a studio very arduously, which is like reading it to and I meant I didn't say so in the thing because it's from the book right. But I was thinking that I'm sending the instructions because I have to read all the instructions to RBG, you know, who recently died and is in the Bardo. Although, and I'm restraining myself from asking her to get out of the Bardo, come back to life, go to the White House and give him the finger. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a bad joke, but that's what I would really like her to do. But she can't do that. And so I've been sending her the instructions of how to be reborn again and become a great justice in an, in an honest court and a properly established court and not this fake Mitch McConnell court that is currently on menu for us. Although, you know, the Democrats can stop it if they have show any guts. They're able to stop it, actually, even though they're a minority in the Senate. They can block it, actually. But they may not, they may be so, I don't know what, 
that they may not do it, actually. Some sort of ideas of precedent or God knows what. And so that's why they get pushed around. You know? So anyway, what I am most interested in is um, this becoming Bardo, uh, Bardo of becoming or Bardo of existence. The actual Sipe Bardo, the word Sipa, actually means existence. So it's sort of the bardo, the third level of the after death bardos, which are the, which is the one where you're fairly sure you're going to be reborn. And it becomes a matter of the quality of how to help someone be reborn. Of course, they have last minute things like close the womb door and this and that. They have some, they have some hopes of shortcutting it, but it's pretty much, um, you're pretty much on the trajectory to rebirth. And um, and that's really important and really interesting. Now, the other thing you mentioned to me that you would like, and I was amazed. I have to, I'm very surprised because I'm getting older now. But when I read in my study before the actual translation, and I, got, I read the section where I'm engaging in the argument that I've been engaging in for 50 years but now with materialists who are having a happy time expecting to be nothing after they die and uh, they, although and even they're so confused actually at some deep level the materialist ideology is that they're thinking they're being brave to be nothing and they're very courageous and they think that people who ha have a common sense of view that there's continuity in everything in life and expecting to go forward in some sort of form or another, they think that those people are kidding themselves and that they, they naively think that they're gonna be reborn in Boulder and they're gonna reborn in your apartment or in New York or in or whatever, you know, and it's just a matter of, well, which neighborhood or like, you know, what will be the income of mom and dad and what school will they go to? And if there's only that kind of a guarantee, Whereas actually, as you said, rightly, that or as that Lama said, the bad habits, although the word in Tibetan is vasana or is bhakchang, uh, and that means instinct actually. So in the, I don't think in the Bardo, your, your living habits are not so much gonna uh, imply because you're not in your neutral body, but your instincts, which are really crystallized habits, which have become autonomic, and which drive you and, and uh, drive our, our conscious life, actually. And uh, if we haven't been yogis, you know, and yoginis. And so um, anyway, I was reading that and I did a really good job, actually. And, um, and so one thing I will really be exploring that in my sections of our workshop. And, uh, the, but I can share the, the most important thing right away, which is that your own mind in arguing with you yourself if you're someone who has been brought up in our culture and that like American or modern culture in any country, actually you could be in Japan or anywhere, if you're educated in a modern way, you are educated by in the consensual scientific materialist reality that of course you're nothing after death. I mean, those, those things about religions and you're gonna go up to God or Jesus is gonna save you or you're gonna to go to hell or you're gonna to go to the Bardo or whatever, that's all ancient superstition. And we know much better now because we're scientific and we're wonderfully rational, marvelous, great civilization. And, we, and that's just ridiculous. So we have a consensual reality that makes us, even if we join in Buddhism, even if we meditate, even if we read a lot of stuff about former and future life, we are living for this life. We want every result in this life. We think it only matters up to, we don't make any bookings for the future life. We don't make decisions about what choices to make in this life about the effects it might have in a future life. We only think of the effects that will come to us in this life. And so we really, we are what the, the Tibetans would define as basically not really spiritual in the sense that we are only living for the purpose of this life. And we don't, we're not really taking into account, like, you know, if you have a, if you have a job, then you worry about saving for your retirement. You have a pension and you, you, know, you have insurance and all this sort of thing, you know, for long-term healthcare and you all kinds of things. We make lots of plans like that. Nobody plans for the next life, except maybe your cemetery plot. 
where you'll be put or your, your ashes will be put, you know, and maybe some sort of insurance to pay the funeral expenses so it won't be a burden on the family. So we plan right up to that. And after that, we don't think we have to worry about it. Now, and so therefore, since that's such a powerful consensual reality that we're, we're sort of, the, we have the vibes of, whenever we say, because maybe we're Buddhist or Hindu or something or Christian or Muslim or Jewish, and we have an idea of a future life going up with, uh, with Dante, hopefully singing with Beatrice in the choir, uh, when someone says that's ridiculous and what's your proof, they say, and I used to get all motivated and I would this and that, and there are there is a lot of proof and we'll, I will go, I'll go into that. But I realize now that's completely the wrong starting point. The real starting point is to the scientist, scientific materialist attitude person. Uh, excuse me, and I like to do it in a joking way and tease them. I say, excuse me, um, which one of the scientists got the Nobel Prize for discovering the nothing that awaits you after death. It, was that 1922 or was that before Copenhagen? Was it Einstein? Who discovered the nothing after death? And they kind of, you know, they think that like some of them actually look like they think about it. And then, and then it's pretty soon it comes clear, nobody. And then I will try to tease further. I love to say, did Carl Sagan show up at a, at a conference? physicist conference or astrophysicist conference and say, it's cool guys, there's nothing happening. I'm just totally cool. So if you can be sure you're right. Uh, no, I don't think so. And actually, actually, what is nothing? Then you ask them, then they, then they get like, what do you mean what is nothing, you know? And then nothing is your mind, they'll say, if they're brave, they'll say. But the point is that nothing thing is insane. The burden is on them to prove there is such a thing. And of course they can't because the word means what there isn't. What doesn't exist, nothing means. It does not exist. And therefore, the fact that you're waiting to go there is a sort of psychotic attitude, actually. And, and you put the burden, that's the, that's the thing you have to prove. <clears throat> they have the law of the conservation of energy, one of the laws of thermodynamics that no energy is ever destroyed. It changes shape or form. And then they have the big thing is like held to the materialist is entropy. So then it gets diffused. But when then once it's diffused, it can always come back again because it's never destroyed. So, so in trying to do this about, if you, even in debating, most importantly, actually debating in your own mind about should you really be making preparation for a future existence, after this existence is over, when you stop breathing and your heart stops beating and your brain is no longer receiving oxygen, should you or not? Well, everything you have ever observed and any scientist has ever observed is some kind of continuity, replete of course with quantum leaps sometimes, like seems like when you burn a log, you know, there are ashes and uh, a lot of it goes off in heat, which you don't see. So it seems like it is reduced to nothing. But of course, you know, that's not true because it puts off heat into the atmosphere and it leaves ashes. And so there's nothing they can point to where something became nothing. And there's no nothing that they can point to. Although actually, in, when I finally felt full confidence in the debate with them, because once you get them on the run with that, then they become... It's, well, unless they run away, which they sometimes, if they're heavy duty natural scientists or something, in case somebody else is hearing them talking with a lunatic, they, won't, they don't want to get busted or not get tenure. So they'll run off and hide. But if they stay there, then you can start talking about near death experiences, post death experiences, and then who people who are resuscitated after a period of time, you can start talking about all the memories of previous lives, the Ian Stevenson research, you know, of the uh, being carried on now, life before life and so forth, children who remember previous lives. And, um, and there's a tremendous amount of that kind of material. And there, of course, there are some past life regression therapists who use it that way, very effectively, some of them, and uh, in some cases. And uh, so there is a lot of proof, and we will get into that. But the real big one is, there's no nothing. However, they do have one thing about that know nothing. And that leads me to my second topic, 
introducing a second topic of this little preliminary talk, and that is in the book of the, in the Tibetan science of dying and being reborn, the Bardo sort of way of looking at it, that which I called I, one of the other reasons I translated it was I always wanted to call it in English the between. I hate intermediate states and this kind of thing. I really don't like it. it. That's like intermediate, you know, Sanskrit or something. It's the between. Bardo just means the between, you know, the, the gap between death and rebirth. And therefore, our life is a Bardo, as you know, of course, and maybe many of your of our listeners know. This we're in now, right now, we're in a Bardo. We're in the life Bardo. And when we understand impermanence very important wisdom level understanding that is Buddhism is very good at teaching. It's not a religious thing. It's a scientific factual thing that everything changes all the time and uh, agrees with physics, quantum physics and regular physics, in fact, that everything always changes. And uh, uh, so we were in the life between, it's called, between birth and death. And then when we dream, that's why your dream book is so apt and so very excellent because that's called the dream between, between waking, sleeping and waking. And then there's a meditation between. Those are the three life between, in the lifespan. And then there's the death point, the reality between, and the existence between that we're going to focus on. But in all of that context, the challenge and the objective of the practitioner, the yogi or yogini, is to understand reality. It's not to become a Buddhist. It's not just to uh, like uh, have Buddha help you, although that's nice. Bodhisattvas will be there to help you. Jesus might help you if you're from that kind of culture. But any, you know, the, the, your shaman might help you if you're indigenous. So the people will help you, and that's good. But the real thing is to discover reality. And everybody discovers the Buddha mind, every ordinary being, including non-human ones, when they die. Because when everyone dies, for a brief time at least, in fact, death is defined as when all structure is released and the person has to let go of it either willingly or is forced to. And their, their point of continuity is their clear light mind, what we call clear light mind, and, and uh, indestructible drop, a kind of individual way of attaching to the clear light mind, like a drop and which has a codes in it, actually, like genes. I consider it like a DNA code at a deepest, deepest soul level or spiritual level. And, and if they were able to be aware of themselves in that state, an unboundaried, vast, open state, which you also referred to, they would realize that that's perfectly all right. That if they let it all go, there's no way to be nothing. So they don't have to fear being extinguished. And that being everything is kind of a, grivly, a groovy feeling. It's not a grisly feeling, it's a groovy feeling. It's an ecstatic feeling, actually. If you're not trying to, trying to fight it, if you just let go, it's like a vast expansion and it's a sense of release and also a sense that you are everything and therefore nothing else can hurt you. So you feel very secure and very blissful. And it's actually with bliss that you, in a way, only your bliss of melting into that is all that knows it. You don't know it by sitting and saying, oh, that's the clear light, because that would be a dualistic, conceptual directed, concept directed knowing, which would not be complete at all. But it would be, could be useful, but not complete. So this is the point. We are terrorized. One of my main things nowadays in my dotage that I have reached, you know, just maybe pre-demented, but still dotage, uh, is to help people try to realize that human cultures including Eastern ones, Tibetan ones, Indian, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, doesn't matter, not just European or American ones. But our modern cultures, I mean, ancient for thousands of years, are authoritarian, always militarized cultures, adapted to dealing with egocentric people, terrorize us all, and they have us afraid of reality. And we're afraid of nature. There's some lion going to eat us or something. We're afraid of the authorities. We're afraid of sickness. We're afraid of death. And therefore, we're afraid of life. And we consider, like, we're doubtful that, there's, you know, the, the religious people will tell us, God loves you. God is good. And God loves you. 
but we're suspicious because they also tell us God is omnipotent and he made us all and everything. Well, then why did he make us in a scary, why did he make such a scary situation for us? <laughs> if he loved us so much, why does he make us have so much pain, you know, and suffering? That's, that's, that's you know, the, the poet Shelley thought the God that his English compatriots thought about was sadistic, actually. <laughs> which is like a kind of sensible thing to think from all the suffering that we see around us. So the point is, even there, they're terrorizing us. And then the reason that these materialists are so hell-bent on nothingness, as irrational and as blind of faith as that is, that you can be nothing, when meanwhile, nothing, you just have to stop to think nothing is nothing, so nobody bees it. But anyway, they're convinced that they're going to be. But one reason they do, which I'm sympathetic about, is they were harangued by their cultures for so long that after death, horrible things were waiting for them in case they ever had a happy time, in case they ever did something a little wrong, in case they, whatever, it's hell is waiting, you know, because of sin and so on. And so to be able to say, you can't scare me to the church fan because I don't have a soul and I won't have a future life, so I can have a little fun in this life or a big fun or whatever. And then I go, I go on the treadmill of making money and trying to find pleasure and it never really satisfies and so on and so on. So how do we recondition ourselves, reacculturate ourselves into, into feeling that the default situation is that life is good, that reality is good, that there is no mean God who could be handing out bliss to everyone, but is holding it back. No, the clear light of the void, the infinite reality of the clear light with its infinite energy, its Vajra, unbreakable energy, is inexhaustible. It is abundant. It has everything that any cell in your body needs, that any person needs, that any world needs. Nature is good. The world is sitting here growing plants to give us oxygen and we can go swimming in the ocean and then we can drink the fresh water from the rain and the, and, and the land will produce plenty of food if we don't poison it and so on. And we're so lucky, you know, and, and we evolved within that lucky situation. So liberation and freedom is discovering the deep freedom that is the reality of the universe which is not a blank nothing freedom, it's a freedom humming with wealth, humming with prosperity, humming with pleasure and bliss and goodness. That is what it is. And uh, you know, the Mahamudra means in being embraced by that, allowing yourself to be embraced by this kind of the world as your lover, as your beloved and as loving you. And so, but that's very hard for us. And so I'm sympathetic that when they were so scared in Europe, in the 17th century, they came up with this theory, which had long existed. It existed in India in Buddha's time, actually, the, the nihilistic worldview. But they came up with the idea that, well, we're just nothing, so you can't threaten us. You know? And nothing, of course, is nothing to be scared of. Nothing, as envisaged by materialists, is permanent anesthesia. It's permanent opiates. <laughs> it's the ultimate opiate, in fact. And so, there's nothing to be scared. The scary thing is to be reborn and not know how to control yourself, as Andrew was so cleverly and brilliantly saying, and as Andrew has so many good methods to help us rehearse death and rehearse the states of letting go and find parts within our soul, within our heart, within our nervous system even, of how to let go, which will then, of course, massively increase our enjoyment of life when we learn that. So, so don't think that Studying about the Book of the Dead or the Bardo or anything is about hastening ending life. In the in the Bardo collection, one of there's two different things that are normally not translated, but we but they were by one group finally did translate them. But one of them is called Knowing the Signs of Death. So you can be warned. And then there's a big ritual and a big meditation, how to cheat death, how not to let death get you and live as long as you can live. You know, my, my doctor, one of my original Tibetan doctor teachers, who was His Holiness Dalai Lama's uh, physician way back in the 60s, and who refounded the Tibetan Medical Institute in Dharamsala, he 
he uh, once sh shocked some people at the Open Center when I was translating for him, when they asked about people in comas, you know, vegetative people, and should they, shouldn't they just turn them off and all this? And he says, and then he got his back up and he said, no way, keep it on forever if you have to, if you can afford it, you know, that thing. And he really made a fuss about how, how life, especially human life, is so precious. And even a person who they say, the materialists say is vegetative, they might be doing something in a subtle plane in their human mind, even though they can't communicate or move or do anything. But they might be coming to some reconciliation, some things in their mind that will have a big impact on their future lives. So if you could afford it. But then, of course, he had said at the end, well, he, the person who is in that state maybe doesn't want to bankrupt their family in a, in a, in a commercial medical system like ours. And so maybe you should turn it off. But he said the ideal, you should set it against an ideal that life is infinitely precious and should be carried on as long as possible. So those are my two main things. And the third one would be looking maybe at the mechanics as described in the Book of the Dead of the consciousness of the being in the, in the between the, the, the existence or becoming between and how to maneuver and navigate that. That, that might be the third one. But uh, so proof the issue of proof and the issue of coming, bringing to life in yourself your new awareness of being a multiple life person from beginningless past with beginningless previous lives and with an endless future ahead of you, in fact, and therefore with a deep existential concern to use whatever you have left of this human intelligent platform to prepare to navigate that endless future in the optimal way. And of course, the optimal way is to be a Buddha, be an enlightened Buddha. And then you're not only alive, still alive, you're infinitely alive. Amitayas, Amitayas, infinite life is one of the names of Buddha. And you can have many embodiments to help other beings that you love. And you can love a lot of beings. And you will. That's what we'll all do that. Every one of us is going to anyway. But we might, because we'll get sick of being infinitely unhappy so and depressed. So we'll finally bestir ourselves and become Buddhas. And if you study with Andrew, that's will encourage me and help you. And I'll try to help him out with that as I enjoy doing that. Okay? So that's all I have to say tonight. I hope you could hear it. Absolutely. Thank you, okay. Bob, okay. very, very much. Yeah, Thank so I, I only have one kind of exclamation point. Yes. That I thought was brilliant where you're the kind of come full circle that when you study this material, um, anybody who's done it realizes that these bardo teachings, studying death, actually brings you more fully into life. Mm. It, it's not this morose, morbid pursuit. You, you will actually discover that when you hold your life and the lives of others within the embrace of impermanence and death, it's not a morbid preoccupation. Exactly. Or it actually brings things more fully to life. And so that's why these Bardo teachings is like the Tibetan Book of the Dead is like written in code, isn't it, Bob? It, it, and we're, we're here to give people the access code that these teachings are, there's, you know, what I playfully refer to as stealth help. There's more going on than meets the outbound eye. And so when you read and study like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it is equally about life and how Absolutely. to illustrate life. Oh, totally. and, and so it has all totally. these multiple kind yeah. of these reflective. It's like when you learn to be a lucid dreamer then you'll find that when you're awake, you are also dreaming yeah. and you might be, have a chance to become lucidly awake, which means enlightened. <laughs> Instead of sleepwalking through life, which yeah, unfortunately too many people do. So anyway, that's it. So anyway, that's it. That's it for me. I have to unfortunately excuse myself because I managed to get over busy and I have to go do another thing. All right. So thank you so much, Andrew. And we're, 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 we reconvene next week, right? We're on. We start again a week from this Friday. So very exactly, much. Exactly. Exactly. And Everybody thank you else. so much, Anne Marie. Uh, it's, uh, it's Anne Marie is so wonderful organizing and getting all this done. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Anne Marie. Okay. And Great. thank you, Andrew. Wonderful well, to see you, Andrew. Wonderful to see you and wonderful to have all you join us. Thank you for your taking time to yes, join us. Yes, all of you all. Hopefully, we'll see you all next week. So until okay. then. Okay. Yes. Stay safe. Okay, ciao. Thank you both so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, anyone, as they had mentioned, you know, anyone hoping for a deeper dive into the topic can join both Dr. Holacek and Professor Thurman for two weekend workshops beginning October 2nd. 
I will definitely be uh, posting the registration links in the chat, as well as links to Menla's website, Tibet House's website, Dr. Holacek's website, so you can stay connected with our online communities. I'll also be posting a donation link for Menla. Anything you feel you can give is deeply appreciated. It goes a long way in supporting our work and just helps us to continue offering online programming. So thank oh, you all very much. Thank you, thank you Professor thank you. Herman thank and you, Dr. Marie. Holacek. Good thank evening. You. Thank you. Okay. Bye, bye. Thanks, Anne-Marie. All the best. All the best. Bye. Bye. Okay. So I'm going to just leave this room open for a few minutes for everyone to be able to access the links and I will definitely give some notice before closing it out. Thank you again for joining us.